you want to get to the Mayans. We're almost there. Paul, you got to do that sooner. <laughs> oh. Okay, take a look at this. The staff he holds <laughs> is at 23 and a half degrees. No. Oh. There you go. So when you begin to really <coughs> examine these ancient symbols and effigies and so forth in greater depth, they begin to yield up all kinds of interesting meanings. Okay, so now let's get to and the concept of the destruction and rebirth of the world is a common theme in Mesoamerican religion and mythology. On the famous Aztec calendar stone, Surrounding the face of the sun god, about whom all periodic phenomena in nature take place, we see four rectangular panels symbolizing the destruction of the world on each of the previous epochs through which it has passed. And that's again something very consistent with the Western traditions, I mean the traditions from Europe and from Egypt and so forth, but Paul says we need to hurry up and get to <laughs> Thank God for to the uh, Mayan stuff. So briefly, we'll review this. This is from Roslyn Chapel. Lucifer bound. Notice how the rope is coiled around him, very much like the serpent was coiled around Eon, the Mithraic god of cosmic time. And here is Lucifer falling. This idea of falling is something that we find characteristic of many ancient. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. We've covered this, so I'm not going to spend any time on this. I'm going to keep going. We find many depictions on Gothic cathedrals of these falling deities or falling demons. Again with four wings. Yes. And we have talked about the origins of Halloween and how it ties in with all of this. So I'm going to just zip past here. And we will go. To the Mesoamerican traditions. This is generally interpreted as being a Venus symbol. There's your Omega symbol again. Well, I was going to see how many yeah. of you noticed that the Omega symbol was in there. Yes. Very astute, Bill. Notice also the multi rings mm -hmm. and the fourfold division. It kind of reminds me of the Eye of Horus, too. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. As legends go, originally there were four Tezcatlipokans, all offsprings of the old father god and mother goddess. Each of them was assigned to a color and a direction. The first two created the death gods and the water gods, and the third was the feathered serpent, and the fourth was the sun god. The four Tezcatlipokas initiated a series of suns or creations, each of which ended in collapse and disaster. After the end of the fourth sun, which was destroyed by floods, the sky fell to the earth only to be raised again by the Tezcatlipocas who used the four world trees to hold it up. Now, there were different gods in the ancient Mayan and Aztec traditions that were shown as falling. This is Kuhua, and to try to get you to See a little clear what's going on here. Mm. You see the hands is holding this this object here, some kind of a some kind of an object, and you see how his knees are bent and his legs are over his head, and he's a diving god or a descending god or a falling god. So we find this motif on both sides of the Atlantic. And you still have the four sections of the earth in that corner. The right top corner. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there it is, right there. Elizabeth, you are on the ball tonight. Look at this thing right here. Isn't that the same symbol we just saw Eon, the Mithraic god of cosmic time, standing upon? And there's 13 smaller stones. Yeah, there's all oh. kinds of stuff going on here. And then we find 
the square, mm -hmm. a Masonic symbol, the right angle, and here we have a Masonic cup or vase around 1200 AD. And again, I know it's difficult to see, so I'll try to point it out to you. Here's the arms, and he holds, notice he's got something in each hand that he's holding like this. And the legs, coming up here's the, the legs bent at the knees, and here's the feet. Oh. You see, he's, he's diving, he's descending. This is another depiction of the descending God. What does he hold in his hands? Biscuits. Biscuits, yes. Right here? Yeah, and then look at this. Uh, Laurel just called attention to this serpentine kind of thing up here at the top with something that looks like scales. And here the circle with the dots like this in the middle are star figures. Oh. Notice the upward pointing equilateral triangle. Yeah, again, when you start really looking really looking at these things is when they begin be to a, yield up their meanings. Could that be a pyramid? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. could be. Pyramid. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, this one here is almost totally obscured, but you can still see it was once a diving figure. Now you can see how the legs bent at the knees, upward pointing. The, this has all been a face, but this is a tulum. I've been you, there. You've been there? Do you remember this guy? No. Um, this was oh, the, the temple of the diving God, God, right here. Yeah. So he's over the doorway. He's right over the... Oh, is that, okay, that's where it is. Yeah, right above the lintel of the doorway. The whole thing coming out of the posterior, it's sort of like a comet tail. Like, there's this one and then the last one. Right there, yeah. It looked like the triangle or whatever, but the multicolors on it were as if it was a... a like, the, the trailing, you know, color changes because of the gases of the comet. Mm -hmm. Maybe so. Especially since it's upside down and it's falling. Here's a sail. You can see... See there the legs? Now you begin to notice things like that that you've never noticed before. This is from one of the codices from the Dresden Codex. A diving dog. You notice that the dog has flaming torches. It's getting pretty explicit here, isn't it? But why a dog? So we can call it Rover, yeah. the great planet. <laughs> Good one, Jerry. That's clever. That's, hey, Jerry, is, this is the language of the birds, right? Yeah, all of the hidden little meanings in our language. Well, dog was, is one of their uh, one of their symbols in their count. Yeah. Or did they have a constellation of a dog? Yeah, dog star. Okay, this major, perhaps. Yeah, see? About, mm -hmm. I didn't know about the... The constellations were different with the Mayas and what we're used to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, there's actually a lot of similarities between yeah. that, the, uh, the, the zodiacs of the New World and the Old World. Mm -hmm. Zantamak, the falling god from the Codex Borgia. And then, as it says here, note the rattlesnake glyph in the lower right hand corner. And the rattlesnake was the symbol of what? Pleiades. The Pleiades, yes, the Pleiades. So this is Zantamak falling, and again, language of the birds time, a little time out here while we look at this. Language of the birds says that there's all kinds of weird connections and coincidences in our language that aren't just meaningless coincidences, but notice the name of this god, and let's see if we can spell it backwards. C-O-N-E-T-O-N-E-T-O-N-E-T-O-N-E-T-O-N-E-T-O-N-E-T-O-N-E-T-O-N-E-T-O-N-E-T-O-N-E-T-O-N-E-T-O-N-E-T-O-
And from the tarot, from the European tradition, we have the upside down hanged man. And he's hanging from a letter. <laughs> Some trees in the shape of a Hebrew letter. Aleph. Not Aleph. Nope. Uh -uh. No, it's a... Uh... I guess. Oh. Yod? No, not Yod. Tav? No. What about Pi? No. 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 It's in it looks like no. Shum? No. Shell? No. It's Jewish. It looks like hey. Like what? Hey. Bat. It's hacked. Oh. Mm. Shit. And what's this down here? There's another Hebrew letter down there. Mem. Mem. It's Mem. Okay, then we remember this, that before the arrival of the first Spaniards in Mexico, over 400 years ago and probably much earlier, the Mexicans told of certain stars called Zantama oh. or falling hairs, <laughs> oh, hair again, which fell from heaven to earth with the Lord of the Dead. Now in Egypt, who was the Lord of the Dead? Osiris. Osiris, right. Their fall was commemorated annually in the Kaholi festival, said to have been held towards the end of October. This festival and the falling of the stars was associated with the end of the world. And of course, what do we still do at the end of October now? Oh, Halloween. Halloween, right. The Lord of the Dead governed the festival of the dead preceding the Kaholi, during which the spirits of the dead were supposed to return to earth from the land of the soul of souls in the sky. No doubt they were believed to have been accompanied by their deity whose fall is mentioned in the ritual. On sheet eight of the Mexican Vaticanus 3773 and the Bor and in the Borgian and other codices, these stars of the falling hairs are depicted falling from the sky to earth accompanied by many other stars further identified by the conventional star symbols beside them. So now when we look back at this, here, these are the star symbols he's referring to. And the idea perhaps here is that there was a main object accompanied by a host of an entourage, if you will. And as we're going to see, the geological evidence sort of confirms that. The Vaticanus Codex antedates the entrance of the first Spaniards into Mexico and depicts traditions much older than that date. From these facts, it seems reasonably certain that the Zantamak were November meteors, whose falling hair referred to the fiery trails left behind them. But the Mexicans seemed to have distinguished between the different meteor groups, for they refer to the fall of Zantamak on the day one eagle which pertains to Taurus, and would seem, therefore, to refer to Taurid meteors. The end of the world would naturally be associated with the memory of one of the great meteoric showers during November, when all the stars seemed to fall from the sky. What object was probably part of the November, I mean, the Taurid family that's significant this Tunguska. year, 2008? Yes, the Tunguska object. 1908, Tunguska, Siberia, mm -hmm. almost certainly a member of the Torrid system. And then at Akansa, where the stucco zodiac, uh, on this zodiac, which represents the signs in regular sequence, the position of Taurus is occupied by two panels, the lower of which represents the rattle of a snake. It is Zabek, the rattle astrum, our Pleiades. The upper panel contains a down-flying, semi-human or ape-like figure. Beside his tail are star symbols, and above his head are spears or arrows, implements of war, which in the Kaholi festival represent the end of the world. Um, now, very interesting work. The Smoking Gods, Tobacco in Maya Art, History, and Religion. Peculiar groups of small gods on different classic stone monuments were documented in detail by Alfred Maudsley, I guess. But not until 1913 did they receive special attention in the work of Spindon. The effigies are small anthropomorphic spirits 
with long upturned muzzles, wide open mouths, prominent incisors, and short lower jaws. They are most commonly seen on the ruler's ceremonial scepters, which during late classic times in some centers replaced the double-headed serpent, ceremonial bar as a symbol of authority. Now, let's look at the last one, the flare gods. The last group is probably the most significant. Now, this is introducing you to a Mayan god here, a flare god who is also called by Mayanists God K, one of the principal deities of Maya mythology, whose exact nature long puzzled Maya specialists. Shelha's first identification of God K in 1894 was based primarily on the effigy's proboscis, What's a proboscis? A nose. a nose. Recently, however, interest has focused on the tube and coils forehead ornament, which was identified by Spence's foliation and by Thompson as bill, a vegetable element, the sign of floral growth. However, the recent, the modern Mayanist, Michael D. Coe, initially also accepted this explanation. Later, however, he changed his views because the forehead ornament often appears in both codices and monuments over the glyph fire, and therefore it surely represents smoke, if not fire itself. Um, as a separate element, the tubular pipe occurs only once prefixed to star glyph. I have suggested that the combination is to be read Bud's Eck, which means smoking star, a known Yucatec term for comets. The inscription suggests that the pipe has been fit infixed into the head of God K. Now let's look at what we're talking about here. Let's get a picture of God K. Where is God K? Where is that Here's God K. Now there you see, sitting upon this hand, he's seated. He would not be allowed to be at Edo Mounds. <laughs> now notice, here's the tube coming out of his forehead, the flared tube, the flare gun. He's also got one coming out of a top knot on his head. And the back, too. And on the back, yes. Try yes. It. So this is the flare god. And notice his characteristic feature of the, the nose, the proboscis. This is how you can identify this guy. So when you're looking at Mayan uh, iconography from now on, you're going to be able to recognize this guy. Now this is another thing that occurs quite frequently. <laughs> Cigar smoking god. Notice what's coming out of his forehead. The flare. Face of the god K and the serpent dragon. Now let's see, I know that's difficult to see, but you see there's a big serpent winding around on this base. And here's the death god. These, these vases tell stories. Now, here's a glyph from, we'll come back to that. Here's a glyph from Stella Five at Tikal. But that's a number nine, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, this is the number yeah. nine. Right there it says, mm -hmm. the flanking the glyph for the number nine. Yep. Now notice on the left is the glyph for smoking star comet. And on the right is god K. Now this is important that these two symbols are juxtaposed together. That we see God K explicitly associated with their glyph for comet or smoking star. Let me back up a little here. See, and one reason I wanted to belabor some of the other symbolism from other sources was so that when we look at this you'll see the obvious correlations and correspondences. Here we go. The first to consider the identity and nature of God K was Brinton. Now these are all famous Mayanists. If you ever read any Mayan stuff you'll encounter these names over and over. Shelhas, who recognized the astronomical significance of this deity, thought that he might represent a star, this God K. Forstman was Shelha's contemporary associated God K with the date 13 Ak and considered him to be a weather god because his ornamental nose, according to the conventional mode of the Central American peoples, is intended to represent the blast of the storm. Barthel, in 1952 article on the Venus cult, also regarded God K as one of the storm gods. 
Sealer, following the same line of reasoning, associated God K with the old rain serpent and believed that the long-nosed masks ornamenting so many of the ancient Maya buildings are portraits of this deity. And the vase, this is one of the vases, I'll show you the picture in a second. The vase of the king's vision is a yellow incised vessel from the late classic period. The center of the scene is occupied by a figure of a ruler sitting on a low throne. He is looking intently at a creature who has a human body and a monster head. The creature has a large god eye and fangs, and the scrolls emerging from his mouth may indicate that he is breathing fire. In his hands, he is holding tightly a tubular object, a cigar, from which also scrolls emanate. Now, we'll find that if you look at the Mayan glyphs, repeatedly, over and over again, you find gods who are smoking. Deities holding large cigars or torches are also portrayed in the late classic vase of the old god holding a flare. Okay, a beautiful carved ceramic that Michael D. Coe calls vase in Chocola style. Two mythological scenes also depicts a deity bearing a cigar or torch. The vase of the black warrior is an old favorite of Mayanists. It is mentioned here because one of the main characters pictured on it is carrying a smoking cigar in his hand. And finally, a young deity holding a torch or a large smoking cigar in his left hand is depicted on the plate of the young god with the flare, a ceramic probably of the late classic period. So now, in Keech, a shooting star, falling star, or meteors is referred to as whatever, which means a flaming arrow. Here, Cha'abi refers to the tip or point of an arrow, dart, dagger, or spear, while Ka'ak means fire. And we go on here, um, we're going to speed on because I see now we're running out of time. But some, now, okay, now here's where we start putting it together. Some highland and lowland Mayan peoples describe meteors or comets as the cigar butts of the gods. Mm -hmm. And it may be well that the cigars smoked by the hero twins and the popal vu are to be understood as meteors. Throughout the Mayan area, meteors are thought to be evil omens forecasting sickness, war, and death. Okay, contemporary Maya people say that meteors are connected with discarded celestial cigars and cigarettes, torches, and ancient arrowheads made of obsidian. Well, yeah, a number of contemporary Maya terms do not distinguish between comets and meteors. This may also have been true in earlier times. The colonial period term, Shamal Zutan, means cigar of the devil is interpreted as a comet. But Jesus Galindo suggests that when these cigars are discarded, they are transformed into meteors, um, which are also referred to as arrows of the devil. Uh, some of the other terms for comets are arrow star, um, etc. Let us go on. Several unpublished studies have linked the image of God L smoking a cigar, that's this guy, in the Temple of the Cross at Palenque with the passage of Halley's Comet in A.D. 684. The Venus God, his cigar could represent a comet. Um, in some temporary celestial events, such as comets and meteors, clearly need further study. Um, a rare Maya text referring to a smoking star evokes connections with Aztec descriptions of comets. Comets may be cigars smoked by Maya gods, but a discarded cigar could refer to a meteor. And so when we begin to look at these, what we see, here's the smoking monkey. Remember, that's the same monkey, the spider monkey, that we saw falling on the stucco relief. And here's the Eastern Door Jam, Temple of the Cross at Palenque. Let's look in here at this guy and see what he's doing. Here he is. Look at this guy. 
What's he doing? Smoking a cigar. He's smoking a cigar. Let's, uh, this is describing, here he is. I've done up a little color. Notice that he is smoking a cigar. Now, what I'm trying to get at here, now there's a lot of stuff we could look at here, but since we're running out of time, we won't take the time to analyze this in depth. We will get to some of the other images. Here's, notice, vase of God K with flaming hair. Now, if one were to propose hypothetically that the Mayans were obsessed with comets, torch bearing dog or beneath, beneath a, what's called a celestial dragon strip from the Dresden Codex and notice his torches. And here's a, another torch bearing god from the Dresden Codex. Lots of their gods are bearing torches, smoking cigars, or have these fiery flares coming out of their foreheads. Now in our European tradition, we see a deity or angel, a godlike figure. Notice the torch. We've seen this before, but again I'm suggesting there are parallels here between both sides, the, the old European and the old Mayan traditions. And then we will go very quickly, how much time we got, like five minutes? Uh, about ten minutes. Ten minutes, okay good, that's just enough time, okay. So, these are, we're going to look at briefly some artifacts from the sacred well or the cenote of sacrifice. Who knows what a cenote is? It's a, a, a What is it? It's a hole filled with water. Yes. We'll look at this here. It's a what? Hole it's a hole filled, filled with water. I forget the other term for it. I don't know the other term either. But we'll we'll get into this in a little more depth. Chichen Itza was an important and well known holy center that was once one of the great pilgrimage sites in the Yucatan. The etymology of Chichen Itza means mouth of the well of Itza. It emphasizes its significance. In this flat, arid peninsula of 93,000 square miles, a series of natural wells, cenotes, penetrate the limestone to a vast underground bearing <coughs> water stratum. Without this water, life would not be possible in the Yucatan. Chichen Itza has two large cenotes, and several of its important monuments are situated between them. The terrestrial plane of the Maya cosmogram was conceived as having reptilian form. Communication with underworld levels was believed, get this, was believed to be possible through caves and cenotes. Communication with the underworld. Right? Recall to, this should be recalling to your mind uh, Greek myths such as Demeter and Proserpine going into the descending into the underworld. Right? Many temple facades in Yucatan are composed of giant reptilian masks apparently representing Itzamna, the earth monster, or Wheat's monster. Caves and cenotes are known to have great significance in the sighting and orientation of many Mesoamerican cities. The evolution from a sacred cave underworld entrance to a temple mountain underworld entrance has been suggested by several authors. This is the Well of Sacrifice, the Sacred Cenote at Chichen, I Chichen Itza. And here's an older photograph I was able to find, an aerial view. A hole filled with water. So when you say sacrifice, And there's lots of bodies down in there too. Yeah, they actually sacrificed mm -hmm. young virgins like her. Now when you're walking through the jungles there in the Yucatan, you got to be careful because you might walk upon a cenote and if you're not looking carefully, you'll fall right in. And some of them don't have bottoms. Question. Were any of these used as like initiation things for men that they would have to swim to the bottom to get a something and bring it back to the top? I don't to, know. To pass. Sounds like a kind of a cool idea though, doesn't it? 
Well, but some of didn't make it, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> now this one, about 20 feet down, was water. But when I was at this one, I talked to several divers who said they had been trying for years to find the bottom of the thing, and no one had ever found the bottom of it yet. Wow. Wow. So, I mean, you look at that there, I mean, you can almost, an entrance to the underworld? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, really. And here is a photograph taken down inside of a cenote. It's beautiful. Oh yeah, some of them are really cool. Looking down into one, this is one where we could actually go down and swim in it. Well, are they all over the place? You're going to find out in about a minute and a half. We can't wait. We hurry. Now, when? Wait, wait. At the, oh, okay, at the at Chichen Itza, at this particular cenote, and they held lots of ceremonies around this, including <laughs> apparently human sacrifice, unless unless the human remains they found in there fell in by accident. But they did find human remains and lots of artifacts. And these artifacts are very interesting. The artifacts that they dredged out of the sacred cenote at Chichen Itza. And we'll take a couple of minutes just to look and familiarize ourselves with some of those artifacts. And the first thing we see here is a scepter with diving figure. This should be familiar now to all of us. A diving figure, you know, over and over again. And, and that went through a dredge? It was, yes, they dredged it up out of the muddy bottom. Clam bucket dredge. What? A clam bucket dredge, not a water. Probably, a, yeah, probably a manually operated because it was dredged during the early part of the 20th century. And I, I think it was all pretty much manual. It wasn't a pump? No. Okay. No. And there's stone? These are stone? No, these, this is wood. Wood. Now, if you look carefully, let's see if we can see what's going on here. You obviously can see the face. And yeah. here that's is the, the feet. Uh -huh. And there, right there you see the upturned yeah. leg. Well preserved. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, it was, I guess because it was preserved down in the mud. Well, is it two or is it one? Well, it's, it's, it's just two views of the same yeah, set. Right, okay. Yeah. Now, oh. Okay, here is a, this shows a little more clear what we're looking at. And here, uh, you can see, he, here's his hands, and he's got... He's, a, he's almost like out of parachute. <laughs> yeah, well, notice here, his, like, notice these coming out of his head, these scroll-like figures. And also notice this, this cross-hatching is a, a, a hollow chamber. Okay, that hollow chamber is important in understanding the ritual that they were actually conducting. Okay, here's a closer up view of it. Uh, dredged from the cenote in May of 1904. Has a perforated chamber, and the inside of that perforated chamber, it's charred. Okay. Aha, uh -huh. very important clue. Is it torch? It yeah, tor uh, they had a fire lit in there. Okay, here you can see the perforated chamber. And also, look at his hands. Look what he's got. Egg McMuffins. What is the egg <laughs> McMuffins? Who came up with that idea? Firer. Some silly person. What is it really? He's not going to this? tell us. <laughs> this? Uh, okay. The lower, now this is describing the staff that we've just been looking at pictures of. The lower end of this staff of office originally had the recurved tip of a dart thrower or a tlaspel. For the Maya, such scepters became symbols of lineage. This diving figure scepter with a large bow at the forehead and a simple rounded collar descends holding balls that may represent copal. Smoke from burning copal probably poured from the chamber between its bent legs. Small perforations near the rim suggest that a lid may have directed the smoke out the side slots and through the lattice at the back. Mm -hmm. now you got a picture. Here they've got this diving figure. It's got a chamber <coughs> and copal is this resonance, resinous incense. They would form it into balls put it into the chamber and light it on fire so that smoke poured out the end of it and then they would throw these things down into the cenote. 
with the smoke streaming out the back. So how large were those? Um, probably about like this big. Maybe a couple, about two feet long, I think, is what they were. Now here we go in, we can see some of the characteristics we have. Long hair. The face of the thing was a mosaic with over a hundred jade and turquoise tesserae, or little tiles. Here's the perforated chamber for the burning copal resin. Stylized feathers. Here you can see the bent legs. And here are the balls that may represent the copal. That's a lot of work for something they threw away. Yeah. Now. Who said, I mean, couldn't that have been an accident? Maybe it floated. Cenote of Sacrifice. This is Mayan treasures from the sacred well at Chichen Itza. This is what they comment. Descent from the heavens is one of the dominant symbolic themes at Chichen Itza throughout the post-classic period. Descending serpents grace the columns and balustrades of early post-classic structures and birds descend at the front of Toltec warrior headdresses. Anthropomorphic diving figures, of which we've seen numerous examples, became important in late post-classic Maya religion, and the Bishop de Landa described the 16th century Maya feast of Mku, the descent of the god. In the late Mixtec and Maya manuscripts, descending figures often represent heavenly bodies, and copal burning ones might be butts ek or smoking stars or comets. Bring it to a close. So the affiliations are getting pretty obvious here. Mm -hmm. We'll read this last one. Diving gods are also found on the facades of the middle post classic temples of Tulum, blah, blah, <coughs> blah. Throughout the approximately seven centuries, from AD 800 to 1500, of its ceremonial use, <laughs> Objects offered to the waters of the cenote, 20 meters below, descended from above like the copal offered by this figure. Like the fallen copal, which was offered in flames, perhaps the sacrificial objects emulated the setting of brilliant heavenly bodies. You see what we're getting to here? Mm -hmm. And since nice. Sam is going to chase us out of here, mm -hmm. we'll jump quickly to this one. Here is a scepter with two diving figures, one down here, and if we look closely at this, you'll notice the serpent's mouth. Mm -hmm. It's the same as oh. it, yeah. Look at this. Mm -hmm. See the, the head descending from the serpent's mouth? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and then we have at the top, we have the diving figure, and up here we have the hollow chamber. And are these wood too? These are wood, yes. Are they ever made of stone? No, they're usually made of wood. Okay. Um, traces of dark resinous and white stucco coatings and a blue-green pigment on the headband suggest that this scepter was once colorfully decorated. The scepter is extraordinary for the crispness of its carving and for an icon iconographic clarity that resembles the sharp-featured gods of Shen Mool modeled incense burners, although the principal clues to identification have been lost with the paint. The two, I think they're getting almost, they've almost got it figured out here. The two diving figures may signify the descent of two associated celestial bodies.